Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. You have read about and seen additional material on local anesthetic injection techniques. We're going to put it in motion for you by demonstrating not only on the skull various injections, but on a patient as well. You have previously seen or will see a tape on uh, preparation of syringes, both the carpule and the lure lock type of syringe. So we won't repeat that today. First of all, I'd like to demonstrate proper patient position for you. We think about two different things when we think of patient position, a patient who's going to receive an anesthetic injection. First of all, as you've read before, the most common complication in local anesthesia is syncope or fainting. And we invite it when we have the patient sitting upright. So as you can see, we have the patient tip back to at least a degree of 50 to 55 degrees from the vertical, and we'll avoid a lot of syncope and fainting. Secondly, this allows you to sit or stand comfortably and see adequately into the oral cavity for the various injections. Let us recall our landmarks for the inferior alveolar and lingual nerve block. To get our needle bevel to the mandibular foramen, we utilize, as you recall, the anterior and posterior borders of the ascending ramus. We have the patient open as widely as they can, and then we come in with our thumb of that hand and palpate and find the greatest depth of the concavity of the anterior border of the ascending ramus. And you can see my finger on the posterior border of the ascending ramus in a like position. And we know that the mandibular foramen lies on this plane approximately two-thirds the distance from the anterior border to the posterior border. As we make the approach with the syringe, we also at the same time have palpated the internal oblique line so we know where it is. Then we back our thumb off, otherwise we'd be covering our injection site. We make the approach with the syringe with the barrel on the opposite side, approximately over the bicuspids on the opposite side. The puncture is made, and you will note if our thumb is in the right position, it appears as if we are bisecting our thumbnail. We carry on in a centimeter and a half or so, and then increase the angulation of the syringe so that now is about over the first molar and we carry on in and then attempt to get the needle bevel against bone with a light touch approximately two-thirds of the distance from the anterior to the posterior border. Then we would aspirate naturally and inject the solution slowly, which we will demonstrate on the patient. Here we graphically see depicted the final position of the needle and syringe at the mandibular foramen. The medial pterygoid muscle has been partially dissected away to uncover the mandibular foramen. You will note the relative height of the mandibular foramen and the, the uh, position of the syringe over the bicuspid teeth on the opposite side. Let us now turn to the patient. And for purposes of showing this area better, my assistant is going to retract the cheek on the opposite side so that you can see a little better. Andy, if you'll just open real wide for me, please. Now to demonstrate drying the mucosa back in this area, you'll notice that I do have a gauze strip here that I have unrolled to its fullest length, and I place my index finger over the end of it in this fashion and we just kind of sneak along his occlusal plane and just lay it on the mucosa in that area. Don't wipe because many patients will gag if you stimulate them in that fashion. I just lay it there for a few moments and then with my left hand, I remove the gauze and at the same time, my thumb is going in to get our landmarks. We have the mucosa dry. I do have my landmarks. 
with my thumb and second finger uh, on the posterior border of the ramus. Now we'll apply a little tincture of betadine to our injection site. We have that accomplished, and now we'll go to our injection. I know where the internal oblique line is, and our initial puncture will be made just medial to it. Syringe is over the bicuspids on the opposite side, and we give Andy a little squeeze here with our, between our thumb and finger just to distract him a bit. The puncture is made, and I have penetrated approximately a centimeter, a centimeter and a half. Now, I know I am by the obstruction of the internal oblique line. Now I'm going to increase the angulation of the syringe slightly so that now the barrel is approximately over the molar on the other side. And I'm going to sneak on in and very gently try to get needle contact with bone at two-thirds of this distance across the ascending ramus. This I have done, and now I'm going to aspirate carefully. And we see that we're in a safe position. And now I'd like to show, if we can, my rate of injection of the anesthetic solution. You're doing fine, Andy. For our purposes today, we'll just inject about a cc of solution. However, normally you'd want to inject approximately two cc's of injection and then out quickly and allow your patient to close. The long buccal injection affords us anesthesia of the buccal, alveolar soft tissues, and vestibular area, which would be needed in addition to the inferior alveolar and lingual nerve blocks if any instrumentation was to be carried out on these buccal, alveolar soft tissues in the molar area of the mandible. Now let us remember that in giving the long buccal injection, in contrast to having the patient open as widely as they possibly can for the inferior alveolar block, it is better to have them open slightly halfway so that the cheek can be retracted. You have good access and vision, and this also creates tension in the soft tissues of the vestibule so that the needle bevel can be passed through them easily with causing very little, if any, discomfort. Let me just demonstrate briefly here now on the uh, mandible, approximately where we would inject to give the long buccal injection. With the mandible closed slightly, or approximately halfway, we would retract the cheek and put a little tension on it so that the vestibular tissues are tense, they are taut, and our injection site would be approximately at the distal aspect of the second molar. Now, many times it is not necessary that needle bevel be against bone for this injection since these nerve fibers are very close below the surface of the mucosa. All right, let's go to the patient. We ask our patient to open for us, and once again, we're going to retract on the opposite side. Throws a little more light in here so you can see a little better. I'm drying the mucosa again with our uh, gauze pad, just as before. And then we retract his cheek, as you can see here. And this creates tension in these tissues in the vestibule in our injection site. And we'll paint a little tincture of uh, betadine here on our injection site. And our approach with the syringe well out in the vestibule. And with these tight tissues, many times we can make our little puncture here without any discomfort, which we have accomplished now. And our needle bevel is truly only three or four millimeters below the surface of the mucosa. And now I'm going to aspirate to be sure that we're in safe position, which we are, slight back pressure on the plunger. And then we're going to inject slowly approximately a, a cc of anesthetic, which will usually be adequate to anesthetize the long buccal nerve. All right, this we have accomplished, and now out quickly and let our patient close. As we have stated before, 
the mandibular anterior teeth can be successfully infiltrated through labial infiltration, which is not true of the bicuspids and the molars, since we need the inferior alveolar and lingual blocks. With the patient approximately half closed again, just as with the long buccal injection, uh, the lip can be grasped, as we will show you when we come to the patient, and uh, protruded anteriorly and outward, thus again creating tension in these lower vestibular soft tissues through which we can pass the needle bevel virtually without any discomfort. Let us suppose we were going to infiltrate this lower cuspid. And let's remember that the cuspid root is a little longer than the other anterior teeth and the incisors. And our goal, of course, is to get the needle bevel against bone through the vestibule at a level of or slightly below the apex of this cuspid tooth in such a fashion as this. Needle bevel against bone through the vestibule and then our injection is made. All right, let's go to the patient. All right, let us demonstrate infiltration of the lower cuspid tooth. We just have them open partially till we get our retractor placed here again to throw a little more light in here. Now, you'll notice that as I retract Andy's lip here between index finger and thumb, I retract it out and upward slightly, how these tissues become quite tense here in the vestibule. You can see that quite nicely. And if we can keep them tense, again, we can pass the needle bevel through them with literally no discomfort. I'm going to dry the mucosa again in the conventional way, just lying my gauze pad there for a few moments. And then we'll apply a little betadine to our injection site. Needle puncture out in the vestibule at about this angle and then carried right through to bone at a level of or below the apex of the cuspid tooth. And remember again, it's a little longer than the other incisors. All right, this we have accomplished. I'm going to aspirate a little bit. We get no blood back in the syringe. We know we're in a safe position. And remember again that any time needle bevel is against bone, you can lean on it a little bit. This will elicit no discomfort whatsoever. And very slowly, we'll inject approximately a cc and a half of solution. And then out quickly. Now, if we were going to anesthetize one of the incisors, we're doing approximately the same thing. Only our needle bevel wouldn't be against bone at quite as deep a level, but we would come in in the same fashion through the vestibule and carry it quickly to bone at a proper level. Aspirate. And then we would inject approximately a cc to a cc and a half of solution. And then out quickly. All of these anterior teeth can be infiltrated labially in this fashion. I should like to demonstrate lingual alveolar soft tissue infiltration to you. Let us suppose that we were going to remove this uh, lower left cuspid and we'd already accomplished labial infiltration. We know that in removing this lower cuspid by forcep application, etc., we would be disturbing or manipulating these lingual alveolar soft tissues. Now we can infiltrate in the floor of the mouth right at the level of the cuspid where the tissues of the floor of the mouth sweep onto the alveolar ridge. And again, it is ne not necessary to make deep penetration, just two or three to four millimeters below the surface of the mucosa, and inject approximately a half a cc of solution, which would accomplish anesthesia of these lingual alveolar soft tissues. In such a matter as this, with the patient open widely, we can sneak in behind the anterior dentition here, and right where the lingual soft tissues of the floor of the mouth reflect onto the alveolar ridge, we make our puncture and just carry several millimeters deep and again deposit uh, approximately a half a cc of anesthetic solution. And this will accomplish our purses. Let's try it on the patient. 
All right, let's show it on the patient. Andy, if you'll open real wide for me, please. We'll dry our mucosa again in the usual fashion, and then we'll apply a little betadine to our injection site right in the floor of the mouth where those tissues reflect onto the alveolar ridge, just lingual to the cuspid. And then we come in with our syringe at about this angle, make our penetration, and just carry our needle bevel a few millimeters, two or three millimeters below the surface of the mucosa. And I am aspirating now. Everything's fine. And very slowly, we'll inject about a half a cc of solution uh, in this site. And this will very adequately anesthetize these lingual soft tissues adjacent to the cuspid. Let us consider the posterior superior alveolar block or injection, sometimes called the zygomatic injection. You'll recall that the posterior superior alveolar nerves duck into the tuberosity of the maxilla approximately two and a half centimeters directly above the maxillary third molar tooth. Our greatest problem that uh, we seem to have with the injection is uh, getting into the pterygoid plexus of veins, which lies out lateral to the tuberosity. But there are things that we can do to help us with this. Uh, I'd like to show you briefly how we curve the needle with a sterile gauze to keep the needle sterile so that we can keep close to bone as we approach the posterior superior alveolar foramina. You see, I have a gauze square here in my hand, and we just lay the syringe and needle on it. And then I fold the gauze over it so that I am engaging it with finger and thumb, and still at the same time keeping the needle sterile. And I just give it a little twist here. These steel needles are a little passive so that you can get a curve in them. I don't know whether you can see that or not, but you can see that our needle is curved. And this allows us to stay closer to bone as we approach the posterior superior alveolar foramina. All right, let us show you on the skull now how we accomplish this. I'm going to tip the skull over here just a little bit so you can see a little better. All right, with the mouth half closed and again cheek retracted to get the tissues tense in the vestibular area. And at the time when we're drying the mucosa, we can very easily palpate the malar strut or the zygomatic process because our initial puncture has to be made posterior to it. And well out in the vestibule so that as we curve and carry our needle to the posterior superior alveolar foramina area, we will stay close to bone. So we make the approach and my needle puncture will be well out in the vestibule and approximately at a level of the second molar. And now if you can watch and see how I maneuver the syringe in an attempt to stay close to bone. I'm carrying it superiorly and laterally so that as we approach the foramen area, I'm going to be hugging the side of the tuberosity so that we stay close to bone and out of the pterygoid plexus of veins. Graphically, we see the position of the syringe and needle bevel at the posterior superior alveolar foramina. Uh, in so doing this way, we can stay out of the pterygoid plexus of veins. With the posterior superior alveolar injection, of course, we anesthetize the third molar, the second molar, and the first molar, with the exception of the mesiobuccal root, adjacent bone, and buccal alveolar soft tissues. All right, let's see if we can't uh, show it nicely here on the patient again. We're using a retractor, which normally isn't necessary, just so you can see a little bit better. And first, we'll dry our mucosa in. You might close just a tiny bit. At the same time, I'm palpating the malar strut. I know where it is, about here at the second molar. And then we'll use a little betadine again, as usual, in our injection site, well out in the vestibule this time. 
So as we utilize our curved needle, we can stay close to bone as we approach the posterior superior alveolar foramina. We're at about a level here of the second molar and well out in the vestibule, as you can see. Very carefully, we make our initial puncture. Now I'd like you to watch and see how I maneuver the syringe as we approach the posterior superior alveolar foramen. I'm curving it upward, inward, and outward. And with a light touch, we can actually feel the needle bevel penetrate the buccinator muscle, and we know that we've gone far enough superiorly. All right, we'll aspirate here a little bit. We're in good position. And now we will very slowly deposit about two cc's of solution. And this should be adequate for the posterior superior alveolar injection. The posterior superior alveolar injection is a distinct advantage. We'll let Andy close here for just a moment a distinct advantage where that molar strut lies over either the first or the second molar and you anticipate instrumentation on that tooth and it just affords too much of a barrier for a buccal infiltration of that particular tooth uh, to get through or for the solution to diffuse through and there are occasions when the posterior superior alveolar uh, block is needed to afford good anesthesia of either the first and or the second molar, depending upon the site of the molar strut in relationship to the particular tooth. We're going to demonstrate on the skull the anterior palatine injection, which anesthetizes the anterior palatine nerve as it leaves the anterior palatine foramen and sweeps forward to approximately the cuspid area on the same side. This again will anesthetize all of these tissues, soft tissues, from third molar to cuspid. We wish to avoid anesthetizing the middle and posterior palatine nerve since this gives a sensation of fullness to the lateral palate and lateral uh, pharynx, and it creates a situation in which it seems difficult for the patient to swallow. You'll recall the anterior palatine foramen is on a plane anterior posteriorly with the third molar and approximately halfway between midline and the third molar tooth. So we would make the approach with the syringe with the mouth wide open so you can see nicely and I am just anterior to the anterior palatine foramen in the third molar region, as you can see. And we deposit just a few drops of solution after aspirating, and you'll find again that with these palatal soft tissues, due to their fibrous nature, it is difficult to expel solution from the syringe into the tissues, and you have to bring to bear quite a little pressure on the plunger to do so you will normally see the tissues blanch in this area due to the vasoconstrictor in the solution. And as you observe this, you will know that you have got a few drops at least of solution out into the tissues here just anterior to the foramen. Uh, ideally from a quarter to a half cc of solution if you can inject it at this site. Now this will anesthetize, as we said before, all of these palatal soft tissues from third molar to cuspid, which would be advantageous, for instance, if you're going to remove a quadrant of teeth and manipulate all of these palatal soft tissues from third molar to cuspid. Now, on occasion, you may just be carrying out instrumentation on one tooth or removing one tooth. It is necessary to block the entire anterior palatine nerve, and we can infiltrate just palatally to the tooth in question and so-called get a partial anterior palatine block. Let us suppose we were going to remove this maxillary first by cuspid. It wouldn't be necessary to give the anterior palatine block, but just simple infiltration about a centimeter from the gingival margin on the palatal side of that first by cuspid in such a fashion as this. And again, with a little pressure on the plunger of the syringe, and it does take a little pressure, 
expel a few drops out into these tissues. Needle bevel is against bone again. And as you see the tissues blanch, you will know that you've got some solution out into the tissues. All right, let us show you the anterior palatine injection on Mr. Fry. And if you'll open real wide for us. Oh, that's great. Now we'll dry the mucosa here first in the usual fashion. Just resting it there for a few moments. And then we'll apply a little betadine in our injection site. And now we'll make the approach with our syringe. Now you can see I'm at about at a level of the third molar. And we make our puncture and carry our needle bevel clear to bone. Then we aspirate, and again, in the usual fashion. And then we expel a few drops up to a quarter of a cc if you can. And I can see those tissues blanching a little bit. I don't know whether you can see it or not, but we are getting some solution out into the tissues and we know that we have accomplished our mission and then out quickly. And once again, this will anesthetize all of the palatal soft tissues from third molar up to approximately the cuspid area where it anastomoses with the nasopalatine nerve. We'll let you close for just a moment, Andy. Now, once again, if we were just involved with one tooth or the instrumentation upon palatal tissues associated with one maxillary tooth, it wouldn't be necessary to block the entire anterior palatine nerve. Let us suppose we were going to remove the maxillary first bicuspid. Uh, let you slip your retractor in there again, please. And you might turn away from me just a little bit. That's fine. We dry the mucosa, just resting it there for a moment. And then a little tincture of betadine right in the area of the injection, just palatal to the first bicuspid. And then our puncture is made about a centimeter out from the free gingival margin on the palatal surface in approximately that position. And again, needle bevel carried to bone, and then we aspirate. And then with quite a little pressure on the plunger, we just literally need to inject a few drops of solution into the palatal soft tissues. And again, they are blanching a little bit. It doesn't show too well here, but uh, they are, believe me. And that's all we need, just a few drops and then out quickly. And that will allow instrumentation on these immediately adjacent palatal soft tissues of the first bicuspid. All right, we'll demonstrate buccal infiltration of the maxillary first molar. And let's recall, in so doing, that we'll be anesthetizing both the terminal branches of the posterior superior alveolar nerve and the middle superior alveolar nerve, which anesthetizes the mesiobuccal root of the first molar. And this anesthetizes first molar and adjacent bone and overlying alveolar soft tissues. With the mouth half closed, Again, we retract the cheek to create tension in the vestibule. And the needle puncture is made out in the vestibule. And needle bevel then carried to bone. With at least the apex at a level of, or preferably slightly above, the apices of the roots of the first molar. Injection slowly after aspiration of approximately two cc's of solution. Or those of you that are using carpule syringes, your maximum dosage for each injection is 1.8 cc's, but that should be adequate. And then out quickly. All right, let's demonstrate it on the patient. And if you'll open about halfway for me, please. And we might close just a little bit. That's perfect, Andy. I'm drying the mucosa here now. And then we'll apply our tincture of betadine directly above the first molar. Now you'll notice that again, with the cheek retracted, how tense the vestibular tissues are. Out in the vestibule, and I'm approaching the mucosa at about a 45 degree angle, as you can see. Puncture made, carried quickly to bone. 
and then we aspirate. And then we'll inject a good two cc's of solution to anesthetize the maxillary first molar. The maxillary bicuspids are very simply infiltrated uh, buccally, and remember again, we are again anesthetizing the terminal branches of the middle superior alveolar nerve. Just as with the molar, with the mouth half closed, cheek retracted, and our needle bubble is directed towards the vestibule and quickly through the soft tissues and then needle bevel, a gauging bone at a level of or slightly above the apex of the bicuspid, whether it be the first or the second bicuspid. All right, let's show that to you on the patient now. This is very similar to the molar infiltration, <coughs> excuse me, with the except that we're going to change the position of our needle bevel over the apex of the bicuspid instead of the molar. Just close a little bit for me and be fine. We'll dry the mucosa again, and let us show that we're going to anesthetize the maxillary first bicuspid. A little tincture of betadine on the mucosa. Now you can observe again the tight, tense vestibular tissues, and our needle can be very easily passed through them. In fact, on occasion, sometimes you can bring the lip down and actually pull the vestibular tissues over the needle bevel as you make the penetration and then needle bevel carried quickly to bone. We aspirate and inject a cc and a half to a cc and three quarters of solution and then out quickly. Let us now, uh, Let us now uh, depict and as anesthetizing the maxillary cuspid. And in so doing, uh, we'll recall that the nerve supply to the cuspid and the incisor teeth is the anterior superior alveolar nerves. Remembering again that the cuspid root is a little longer than are the bicuspids and or the incisors. Label infiltration, mouth half closed, lip grasped and retracted laterally so the vestibular tissues are again tense and taut, needle directed superiorly through the vestibular tissues and quickly carried to bone, aspiration and injection of one and a half cc's of solution will anesthetize the maxillary cuspid very nicely. Now let's show it on the patient. If you'd open about halfway, Andy, for me, please. And now you might close just a little. Now with retraction of Andy's lip, you'll notice again these tense vestibular tissues. Now we're gonna get just a little higher because of the length of the cuspid root. All right, we've made her puncture and her needle bevel is against bone. And we'll inject a cc and a half to two cc's of solution. and then out quickly. To anesthetize the incisor teeth, again, same technique, labial infiltration, with the mouth half closed, lip retracted anteriorly, needle bevel can be carried in through the vestibular tissues and quickly against bone at a level of or above the apices of the roots of either the central or the lateral incisor tooth, depending upon the tooth you're going to carry out the instrumentation upon. All right, let's again show it on the patient. Same technique, tissues dry, tincture betadine, through the vestibular tissues, 
against bone and aspiration. And again, injection of a cc and a half of solution will very adequately anesthetize either the lateral or the central incisor tooth. One last injection, and again we return to the palate, the so-called nasopalatine injection. The terminal branches of the nasopalatine nerve as it's coming down from above through the nasal cavity and terminating from the nasopalatine canal at the nasopalatine foramen, or sometimes called incisive foramen, directly behind the two uh, central incisor teeth. And by anesthetizing the nasopalatine nerve, we will again afford anesthesia of all of these anterior palatine overlying soft tissues from approximately cuspid to cuspid areas, which we would need if we were going to manipulate these palatal uh, anterior tissues in any fashion. As you look in the mouth, you will see that there is a papillae that overlies the incisive foramen directly over it, and we wish to avoid injecting directly into it since it is extremely sensitive to do so. So we find that it's adequate to make the injection on either side of the foramen and or the papillae, and we can very adequately anesthetize the terminal filaments of the nasal palatine nerve. So demonstrating that for us on either side, carried quickly into bone, aspirate, and then again, it takes quite a little pressure on the plunger to get some solution out into these fibrous tissues. But again, you will see them blanch as it occurs and know that you've accomplished getting some solution out into those tissues. This is a mirror view of the anterior palatine area, and you can see the nasopalatine papillae right here very, very nicely. We'll dry our mucosa and apply a little betadine again. And we'll make our injection just on this side of the papillae. It doesn't matter whether you make it on the right or the left, but one or the other. Don't inject directly into it. All right, we have got our needle bevel against bone and I have aspirated. And now I think as you see as we depress the plunger, you can see the papillae blanch and the adjacent surrounding soft tissue. So we know that we're getting solution out into the area of the incisive foramen to block the nasopalatine nerve. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.